really think you're gonna convince me I'm crazy, huh? Which would be worse? To live as a monster? <laughs> My name is Edward Daniels! That guy is a good man. So listen, I think we all just watch this movie and accept at the ending way too quick. I'm gonna blow the lid off this place. Because after going back and watching it and getting 33 pages of handwritten notes, I'm convinced that he's not crazy at all. You've uncovered a conspiracy so that anything you can dismiss as lies. And that this entire thing was actually an experiment to make somebody that was sane insane. By conducting experiments on the mind. At least that's my guess. I know. It's a big claim and you're probably just thinking that I'm the crazy one here. I and if I say I'm not crazy, well that hardly helps, does it? But all of our answers lie within the storm on Shutter Island. Look outside, Marshal. Storm's coming. The rain. The storm. Hurricane. We all don't wash away first. The storm's hitting the mainland like a hammer. This thing is turning into a Kansas out here. And that's why we're going to get on this ferry right now with U.S. Marshal Teddy Daniels, so that way we can experience everything along with him as his new partners. So tell me again about your partner. What partner? But before we can meet Teddy, I want to make something clear. We're just covering the movie. I know the book differs on its ending. And if you didn't even know that there is a book, luckily with today's sponsor, you can go and check it out yourself. That's right, I'm talking Audible, because I don't know about you, but it just seems like it's so difficult now to sit down and just read. Where Audible can come in and do for you like it's done for me, because I've been using Audible for the last 10 years. And luckily for you, if you sign up using my link down in the description for your 30-day free trial, not only do you get a free audiobook, and if you're an Amazon Prime member, you actually get two free books, but you also get unlimited access to the Audible Plus catalog. And not only that, but you also get members discounts on all the audiobooks that they have to offer and if you decide to cancel the books are yours like forever it's just a free book that you can have you can go and get shutter island or you can go and get the ultimate horror collection which is literally 93 hours of some of the greatest horror novels ever written i'm talking the fall of the house of usher frankenstein dracula jekyll and hyde the call of cthulhu there's so many books just right here for you for free you can have it just use the link down in the description. And with all that being said, thank you for watching the ad, and I think we actually need to go and check on Teddy because he's sick as can be. Pull yourself together, Teddy. Eventually, he gets it all under control where he can come out and meet us and his new partner, Chuck Ayul. You're my new partner. That's right. This is their first time meeting, which is a little suspicious, but it's even more suspicious whenever Chuck refers to Teddy as Teddy Daniels, the man, the legend, I'll give you that. The legend. And not just suspicious to me, but also to Teddy because he asked him, what are y'all smoking up in Portland? Seattle. I came from the office in Seattle. Why would Teddy say Portland if his partner is apparently from Seattle? I know what you're thinking. is, Oh, it's because he's actually crazy. No, it's not. Because Teddy makes it clear that the U.S. Marshals is not very big. So you know how small it is. And I mean, it, it's not. Even today, there's only 94 U.S. Marshals, and then there are 5,000 Marshal deputies. And we find out here in a little bit that both of them are actually deputy marshals whenever we get to see their badges. So I think two things are going on here. One is that Teddy read up on his paperwork and knew that his partner was supposed to be from Portland, Maine. Problem is... Chuck here doesn't seem to really have a main accent. It's just more of like your standard American accent that they would have over in Seattle, Washington. And two, Chuck is already setting up Teddy to start to doubt what he's supposed to know. Now listen, Teddy might be really, really smart, and he's also really good at his job, as we'll see throughout the course of all of this, but Chuck... Chuck is really good at what he's doing because instead of waiting for more questions to come, he immediately avoids and starts to ask questions of his own. What about you? You got a girl? Babe? I was. <laughs> Which just comes off to me like, oh, hey, yeah, you remember your wife, the one that died? Could you please tell me about her? She's dead, right? I'm totally U.S. Marshal. And sure enough, this does get him to think a little bit about his wife because we actually get a flashback. She died. And then Teddy makes it clear that, well, you know, she died in a fire, but it wasn't from the fire. It was from... It was a smoke that got her, not the fire, so that's... That's important. And speaking of smoke inhalation, Teddy can't seem to find his cigarettes anywhere. So Chuck, being a good partner... So this is an important part that I want you to pay attention to because he keeps getting cigarettes from everybody else throughout this film. 
He never has his own, and it always seems like something bigger is actually going on. Because it is, okay? Because there is something bigger going on. But one thing's for certain that we know right now, somebody took his cigarettes. Government employees are rocket flying. And we also know that we are currently headed for a mental hospital. For the criminally insane. <laughs> and since they're getting closer to the island where the asylum is, the ferryman now comes out to tell them, whenever we get there, if you guys would hurry up and get off of the ferry, because I need to set off as fast as possible. Why? Storm's coming. The first person to mention the storm is the ferryman. Doesn't seem like much now, but I'm telling you, this is a huge moment for the whole purpose of what is actually going on. And that happens before they even step foot on the island to meet Deputy Marshal McPherson. Welcome to Shutter Island. I'll be the one taking you up to Ashcliffe. As well as all of his other guards and deputies and stuff who all look like they're really on edge. The boys seem a little on edge, Mr. McPherson. Right now, Marshal, we all are. And some are gonna say, well, yeah, it's because Teddy's crazy and they're scared that he might do something insane and jump back on the ferry or blah, 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 blah. <laughs> Look, I don't know if you've ever been on a job and like a supervisor or a big boss man or an inspector of sorts shows up. Everybody becomes nervous because they're scared they're gonna get caught doing something wrong. And whenever there's a bunch of people doing a lot of stuff that is wrong, of course everybody's gonna be on edge. And speaking of being on the edge, the actual edge of the perimeter of Ashcliffe is electrified. Electrified perimeter, how can you tell? Teddy knows this because he's seen something like it before, which we'll learn all about his PTSD here in just a little bit. First, we have to learn the layout and all of the rules that are here at Ashcliffe. During your stay? You will obey protocol. Then we have Ward A. The male ward. Ward B. The female ward is the one on your left. And Ward C in the back for the most dangerous of patients there at Ashcliffe. Admittance to Ward C is forbidden. And if Teddy and Chuck want to get in to see any of these, they got to hand over their guns. You are hereby required to surrender your firearms. And this throws Teddy for a loop because he's not just a cop or anything like that. He is a duly appointed federal marshal. We are required to carry our firearms with us at all times. And I now understand a lot better why they picked a U.S. Marshal to be the one to go to this island. And I don't know everything about U.S. Marshals, but not just anybody can become one. That's not how it works. An actual U.S. Marshal has to be handpicked by the president. And then the deputy marshals, there's a lot of requirements to even get an opportunity to be considered to be a deputy. So yeah, Teddy needs to have his gun on him and he's required to keep his gun on him. Executive Order 319 of the Federal Code of Penitentiary states that the officers of that institution have final authority. Well, I mean, I guess if you gotta pick between doing your job or leaving because you wanna hold on to your firearm, you kinda gotta do your job. Gentlemen, you will not get through this gate with your firearms. So they hand over their guns. Or at least they kind of do. Everybody notices this because of course <laughs> Chuck just needed a little bit more time to get prepared. So after this they finally get in and we get a brief mention of why they're actually there. Apparently there is a mish mishing patient. When did she escape? This prisoner. A missing patient, but Dr. Colley's actually the one that they need to talk to. I'm afraid Dr. Colley will have to fill you in on the situation. And even McPherson here talks up Dr. Colley quite a bit because their whole thing that they have going on in Ashcliffe is they're taking in people that society has deemed beyond treatment. And it's all due to Dr. Colley. He's created something really unique here. But the most memorable thing to me that happens out of this entire thing is this lady. Yeah, she kind of creeps me out too. But it's clear here that she's just mimicking what she was told before the marshals got there. Now we've all just made it to Dr. Colley's office so that way we get to actually talk to the man behind everything here. Marshal Daniels, doctor. And it's actually the things behind the man that Teddy finds so interesting. So he has to get a little closer look at these odd pictures on the wall. Which for somebody that claims to want to do things differently and to experiment with new stuff, it seems odd that he would have all of these barbaric ways to fix people hanging up in his office. They were beaten as if whipping them bloody would drive the psychosis out. But this being his job, maybe he gets a pass for it. And then he begins to describe to Teddy some of the experiments that they would do 
back in the day. We drove screws into their brains. One of those being how they would submerge people into icy water until they lost consciousness or even drowned. Notice the emphasis on that last part. Drowned. And the fact that Teddy had zero reaction. I mean, why would he? But this here is just the start. And this is an idea that they're now planting into Teddy's mind. Because they want him to be just like all of the murderers that are there. Oh, wait, sorry. Patient. Excuse me, patient. And the missing patient that they came to find is named Rachel Solando, and she escaped within the last 24 hours, and nobody knows where she is. And what is she in for, you ask? Uh, she considered dangerous. You could say that. Well, she decided it would be a good idea to... She killed all three of her children. She drowned them in the lake behind her house. Teddy has the same reaction I did. Gotta ask the question, what about her husband? He died on the beaches of Normandy. Well, with the answer that he died in World War II and the pictures of Rachel after she had been starving herself, insisting that her kids were still alive, it reminds Teddy of whenever he was in World War II. You can also tack on the dead kids as well as the fence that we saw outside earlier. And all of this combined together seems to weigh down on Teddy quite a bit. Sorry, Doctor. You don't happen to have an aspirin, do you? So Dr. Colley, being the nice guy that he is, decides to give him some aspirin. The simpler the better. Oh, thanks so much. And so if you're asking me, this is the second dose already that Teddy is getting. Perhaps the headaches, Marshall. I mean, they gotta be quick. This stuff takes around 48 hours to really kick in. Cause they know what they're doing. They have a whole plan. And the next step in their whole plan is actually Rachel because we find out that for the last two years, She's never once in two years acknowledged that she's in an institution. She has been thinking that she's not in an asylum, that she's actually at her house and everybody else is just delivery man, repair man, milkman, all stopping by while her kids are at school. And Teddy just laughs because he thinks the whole thing is just completely unbelievable. <laughs> You're kidding me. And even though it seems unbelievable right now, it won't be because by the end of it, he will fully understand what it means for somebody to have their mind completely altered by this idea that was being planted right now. She's created an elaborate fictional structure and she gives us all parts to play in that. Fiction. But all of that comes together later, and at this moment, they need to figure out how Rachel got out of her locked room with nobody noticing and then just disappeared without a trace. It's as if she evaporated straight through the walls. And the best place for them to start is going to be in Rachel's room. And it's here where the investigation actually starts, but of course, this is just a regular room in an asylum. But, I mean, they got a locker and a bed, and I guess there's some extra shoes, but not just an extra pair of shoes. There's both sets of the shoes that were issued to Rachel. So that means that she's just out there barefoot. Come on, Doc, she couldn't get 10 yards in that terrain. But that's not even the weird thing that they find in the room. Teddy actually sees a part where the tile has been lifted up and he finds a note underneath. The law of four and who is 67? I have no idea. Who is 67? And I would say that I was with Chuck and Dr. Colley on this one, but they they have this look of, I, I don't know, never heard of before, but it seems suspicious. What do you think it could mean? I think it's just random scribblings. But that's just the thing. Dr. Colley won't leave it there. He has to clarify that, yeah, I mean, she did, you know, do a bunch of bad stuff and is actually insane. But she also is really smart, so it's probably not just these random scribblings like you think it is. There's probably a deeper meaning, and you should try to figure that out. Oh, no, not at all. Rachel's smart. Brilliant, in fact. After gathering this evidence... That was totally not planted by Dr. Colley or Chuck. It was definitely not Oops. planted. Excuse me, doctor, but... We're gonna have to hold on to this. They then learned that Rachel somehow slipped by seven orderlies without any of them noticing. She turns invisible? What you mean is a good question because is she even real? Was she ever real? Who is Rachel Solando? And depending on what you think happens in the end will be what determines your answer here. But before that, we're gonna have to see the records of all of these orderlies to see who is in on it. Doctor, we're gonna need access to the personnel files of all the medical staff. Because there is no way Rachel got out of her room without some help. You will comply. All I can say is I'll see what I can do. And I mean, Kali might as well just say, no, not gonna happen. Uh, you're here to investigate, but 
you're not getting anybody's information and I'm not going to help you except for walk you around. Which, I mean, I kind of get why Kali's being the way that he is because he does have to clear everything through the board, which Teddy demands to meet with them now. I'll assemble them in the common room after dinner. And in the meantime, that means Teddy, Chuck, and McPherson are going to go search over at the Bluffs to see if Rachel is out there or if there's any evidence that she ever existed. And I mean, these guards out here doing a great job, totally doing everything they can to find her. But that's not the thing that caught my attention. It's the fact that they're all wearing raincoats, which makes perfect sense. There is a storm coming. It's kind of raining on and off, you know, over here on the island. We've got a little bit of showers, a little bit of sprinklage going on, but just keep it in mind. And this is the other thing that you need to keep in mind. What about those caves down there? Have you checked them? I mean, nobody could actually make it up there to those caves, and like they already found out... She's got no shoes. So since all of the guards have got this side handled really well, Teddy and Chuck set off with McPherson to the other side, kind, kinda, to see the lighthouse. What's that tower? It's an old lighthouse. Those guards and that big fence make you really wonder, What's up there at that lighthouse? Sewage treatment facility. Oh, yeah, that makes perfect sense that they would keep that guarded. The guards already searched inside it. So hear me out for a second, because we know what happens. We know that he shows up, and he goes up, and it's just a desk in the lighthouse. So why would they be guarding it? And on the surface, that doesn't make any sense. But they could be holding Rachel in there, or they could actually have some other stuff going on if there's some crazy experiments on the on the brain going on you know because for this entire time they are like an entire day day and a half ahead of teddy in everything that he does teddy sees this as suspicious and we can see here he's really good at his job sir i didn't see nothing glenn tell me the truth i maybe went to the bathroom I mean, he's over here asking all the questions and getting all the answers and just full-on intimidating people and full-on interrogating everybody in the room until he gets the answers that he needs. Does anyone here know what she did before that? She was in a group therapy session. And one of the answers that he gets is about Rachel the night before whenever she was in her therapy group, and she actually said... She was worried about the rain. Which is another time that somebody else has mentioned the weather to Teddy. And right after this, we run into a problem. Yes, Dr. Sheehan led the discussion. Dr. Sheehan? Because now Teddy's wondering who's Dr. Sheehan and where is he at? He left on the ferry this morning. His vacation was already planned. It's just the funniest thing watching this back because you see Chuck over in his chair just cowering like, oh, please, nobody look at me. I am not here right now. I'm on vacation. But even with that, Teddy doesn't leave it there. He needs a phone number because he's got to talk to Dr. Sheehan. I mean, that's that's literally why he's there to do this job to figure out what happened to Rachel. Do you have the phone number for where he's gone? So they try to go make a call at what I'm going to call the call room over here where you've got this caller guy trying to call into the main land so that way they can then call Dr. Sheehan. I'm sorry, sir, but it's all down. All the lines. The storm's hitting the main end like a hammer. They can't because of the storm. You'll understand later why this line frustrated me so much and made me really believe that this is all just a setup to convince Teddy Daniels that he is actually this other guy named Andrew Latis. And it doesn't end there because right after this, Collie goes to leave and he tells him, I'm going to be at my house around 9, you guys should stop by then. And Teddy says, great. Then we can actually talk. And Kali says, We have been talking, Marshal. Teddy's been asking questions anyway, and Kali has just been planting answers that won't sprout until later. So time passes, and Teddy and Chuck pull up to this lovely house where they hear just this beautiful music playing, and Teddy knows who it is. Who is that, Brahms? No. Which immediately begins to remind Teddy of his time in World War II. It's Mahler. Because Mahler is actually a Jewish composer who was a very big deal around World War II, and I am nowhere near well-versed enough to be able to explain to you anything about him or his lovely music, but there is an entire history with him being Jewish and a specific political party that I don't think I can actually say 
the name of here on YouTube. So if you want to know more, you're going to have to go look him up. But right now, as Teddy looks up, he sees Dr. Nyring. And so they have a little bit of banter back and forth, and Kali asks for everybody's drink order. Teddy says that he doesn't drink. Your poison, gentlemen. Right, if you got it. Soda and ice, please. Which leads into a kind of heated discussion between Dr. Nyring and Teddy himself. Isn't it common for men in your profession to embark? What's that? Iced tea in your glass there. <laughs> you have outstanding defense mechanisms. Which is interesting because, of course, he's a psychiatrist, so he tries to turn it around on Teddy and Chuck by telling them that they're men of violence. I'm not accusing you of being violent. And he continues down this line of thinking as he sort of unpacks Teddy's backstory, essentially. You both served overseas, huh? For all you know, we're both paper pushers over there. You are not. And we get to see a little bit of Teddy's backstory through flashbacks of him being in World War II. And the entire time, this Marlar song is playing louder and louder in the background and comes all the way up to a point to where Teddy is asked if he believes in God. Do you believe in God, Hush? <laughs> no, I'm quite serious. Now, where I would just respond, amen, thank you, Jesus, Teddy shows us once more how good he is at his job as he picks up on Nyring's accent. You ever uh, seen a death camp doctor? Concentrationslager. Huh? Then he calls him out on it, saying that his English is really good, but it's not perfect. English is sehr gut, fast, perfect. You hit the consonants a tad hard, though. With all that being said, Teddy says, just give me the documents that I came here for on Dr. Sheehan and all of the staff so that way we can figure out who's behind all of this. No personnel files will be released to you. Once again, he's told no. We're gonna need those files. Out of the question. So, I mean, what do you do? Like, you can't get any of the information you need. You're trying to do an investigation, so that really only leaves one option. This investigation is over. Because clearly nobody here actually wants any help, so they're leaving in the morning. We're taking the ferry back in the morning. But for the night, they're staying in the orderly's quarters, and what Teddy says to Chuck is gotta be the truest thing to be said so far in this movie. We haven't heard the truth once yet, Chuck. Isn't that basically what I just said? I... I don't know, maybe I'm dreaming. Okay, maybe it's not me dreaming, maybe it's Teddy dreaming. Dreaming about his wife, whose name we don't find out till later in the movie, but it's actually Dolores, if you forgot. Jesus, are you ever sober anymore? Here she's complaining a lot about his drinking, and his response is that... I killed a lot of people in the war. And I don't even know how many movies now that I've covered that have weird dream sequences in them, but... I, I like movies like this, and it gets weirder because she begins to talk about how Rachel is still there and Latis is still there. She's here. You can't leave. So is he. And proceeds to encourage Teddy, saying that you can find them, you can do this. Don't forget the good times. Don't let the bad times overtake. Remember that time that we went to the lake and how good it was. I was so happy. Then there's just water dripping and spilling out, and it's very confusing for everything that's going on right now. You have to let me go. I can't. Even more so whenever she turns into ashes and then just disappears as the entire house is now on fire. But instead of having ashes in his hand, whenever he looks down, they're just dripping with water. <laughs> and it's because they're literally just dripping with water like he's soaking wet there's a there's a leak in the roof that made him soaking wet so listen i know what you're thinking oh well that was the place where she actually drowned his kids and all of this thing happened i, I need you to understand something on how dreams work and how all of this is played out first off uh, she asked about his drinking because he turned it down and was basically interrogated on it by dr nyring doctor did i say doctor doctor then, of course, she brings up Rachel, which is what he has been thinking about the entire time that he's been there, is trying to find her. And then she brings up Latus, as we find out later is, like, his actual purpose for being there is to find Latus. And we also know that she died whenever the apartment caught on fire. It was a smoke that got her, not the fire. So all of these things, plus him being soaking wet from the leak in the ceiling and these ideas that have been planted about Rachel and what she did to her kids, as well as what Dr. Colley has planted earlier, resulted in this dream being this weird conglomeration of everything that his brain is trying to process, which is what dreams are. 
duh. But if you don't agree with me on any of that, and you just think that I'm playing up this entire thing, all we gotta do is look outside at the big storm that's going on. Because yeah, Teddy's soaking wet, but it's actually the orderly that says something about it. <laughs> Be no so of course that means that they're back on the job and they want to talk to Dr. Collie so that way they can arrange a meeting to talk to some of the patients that were a part of Rachel's group the night that she went missing, which is something they'll actually be able to arrange and this leads Dr. Collie into talking about how his treatments are different than what they did back in the past. Between the old school way of doing stuff with lobotomies and surgery. Procedures like the transorbital lobotomy. And the new way of doing stuff with more of a medicine-based treatment plan. Psychopharmacology. A new drug has just been approved called Thorazine. Here he actually mentions a drug called Thorazine, which was just approved. And all I have to wonder is, approved by who? Because later it'll definitely seem like a question that needs to be answered. So Teddy asked the logical question of, well, Doc, where do you fall? And he says that he actually doesn't fall in either camp, but this more radical-based idea of just treat a patient with respect, listen to him, try and understand, you just might reach him. Which, I mean, sounds cool, right? Like, that sounds like a good idea, and then you think of the ending, and you're like, yeah, that's what he's doing now, until you really start to think about it and how he's been lying to him this entire time and will continue to lie and to twist those lies more and more and more uh, to get Teddy to literally do whatever he wants in the end. You can dismiss his lies. And that's the thing, if you're paying attention, you can pick up on these little bitty inconsistencies that Dr. Collie has, just like how Teddy picks up on he has been referring to Rachel in the past tense. Is there a reason you keep referring to your patient in the past tense, Doctor? I mean, why would he do this, you ask? Let's just see what Dr. Colley has to say for himself. Look outside, Marshal. The storm, you say? There's a storm going on outside that everybody knows about and it's right there? Yeah, that probably would be really dangerous to be out in and probably doesn't mean good things for Rachel, right? The more that I get into this, the more that I am convinced of this entire theory. And so now we actually get to one of my favorite parts in the movie is we get to see Teddy sit down and interrogate some of the patients that are there. And the first one is actually Peter Breen, who is definitely crazy and deserves to be there. And then she asks me if she can have a glass of water. Like, that's no big deal. But it's interesting, whenever they ask about Rachel, he immediately just regurgitates what he's heard about her. Rachel Solando. You know that she drowned her own kids? And then just sets off on a rant about what should happen to her, but Teddy, having read through his entire file, knows exactly what it takes to be able to get underneath his skin. Could you st and Stop that. slowly continues to do exactly this as he talks about you stop that? what he did and how awful of a person that he is. You tore our face off. And then explodes to ask, Do you know a patient named Andrew Latus? Do you? No! But he honestly doesn't know, and for this mentally insane man to be under all of this stress and to be freaked out in the moment, he should have dropped the entire act. But he doesn't. Because if Teddy is actually Andrew Latus and has been there for the last two years, whenever he asked Peter this question, Peter should have looked at him and said, it's, it's you, I don't know, it's you, you're, you're Andrew. That doesn't happen. But instead what we get is one of the orderlies giving him this look like, how does he know that name? Then after this, it's on to Miss Bridget Kearns. But just before we start the interview, we actually see a nurse off to the side who is already got a needle and syringe ready to go. And I mean, we're shown a close-up of this, so I'm sure it's important for some reason. That may seem odd, but to Teddy, Miss Kern seems quite normal. He seemed quite, quite normal. <clears throat> the difference is uh, most people don't kill their husbands with an ax. And what she says about her husband after this, it seems like he was not the best guy ever, and it really sounds like they went for the insanity plea instead of uh, the chair. I hear in her voices already. And that's probably how she ended up in here. And so they get to the questions about Rachel, and it's literally the same thing that we've already heard. And we were all her neighbors at the milkman 
postman. Delivery man. Like, it's really clear that she's just repeating what she's also been told. She believes we're all delivery men, milkmen, postal workers. But whenever he starts to ask questions about Dr. Sheehan, you can tell she's a little on edge. And Dr. Sheehan was there that night? Yes. What's he like? Not only that, you can tell that she is actively trying not to look over to Chuck, who's sitting right there. And so to me, it seems like in this moment, she immediately realizes something's really wrong, wrong, like wrong, wrong here. No, Dr. Sheehan's a good doctor. He would because of course she knows Dr. Sheehan. He's sitting right there. So why would this marshal ask about Dr. Sheehan when he's right there. And this is whenever she looks over at Dr. Sheehan, asks if she can have a glass of water, and she quickly does this. Then whenever Chuck gets back, he gives her the glass of water, and it's interesting because, of course, she doesn't know that he's currently going by Chuck. So she says, Thank you, Marsha. And then she does that. Except she actually sets an empty water cup back down on the table. And this tells me two things. One, Teddy can't trust everything that seems to be going on in front of his face. Which, of course, as we know, he's been able to figure that out because he's good at his job. And two, uh, she was really thirsty. Like, that was like a full glass of water that she, like, seemed to, I guess, gulp down in one, one go there. Then this is whenever Teddy decides to ask her about Andrew Latus. Did you ever meet a patient named Andrew Latus? Never heard of him. It's clear that she can't handle any more of this questioning. She said something to you back there, didn't she? She wrote it. And of course, it makes you wonder out of both of these interviews, can we really trust anything that both of these people who have been declared insane have to say? I didn't believe a crazy guy. Because if you were to ask Teddy, he doesn't believe anything that they had to say. She used practically the same words as Carly and the nurse. But Chuck really doesn't care about that. He just wants to know, who's Andrew? She's been told exactly what who's to say. Who's Andrew latest? While he says this, he pulls out another cigarette, gives it to Teddy, and lights it for him. But even with that, of course, Teddy doesn't just want to answer this, and Chuck's like, ah, come on. I'm your partner. We just met Chuck. Finally, Teddy gives in and begins to give more of his backstory, explaining that Andrew Latus was actually the maintenance man on his apartment building. Andrew Latus lit the match that caused the fire that killed my wife. He ended up getting away, and then later on, he burns down a school, which kills two people, lands him in prison. They quickly realize that this dude's insane. We've got to send him somewhere. So they end up sending him to Ashcliff into Ward B. Then it's like he just disappeared. No record whatsoever. And so Teddy thinks that he's now over in Ward C, where they keep all the super dangerous people, which would make sense. But if he's not actually in Ward C, he would probably be somewhere that nobody would actually look for a body. The same thing with Rachel Solando. Only one place no one would really notice. Problem is, why they're out here looking for like a freshly dug grave or some kind of sign that people have been doing something not supposed to out there. The storm starts to get even worse, and Chuck actually says, We gotta get it done! Turn it up! Get us out here! And lucky for them, there's a mausoleum right next to them, so that way they can go and hunker down from the storm. Because the storm is that bad outside, and it is that real. Watch out! This is where Teddy gets another cigarette from Chuck. And immediately after, he begins to ask him more questions about Latus. But Teddy makes it very clear that he's... Not here to kill Latus. I mean, his reasoning is really good because he has had enough of killing. And he talks about his time back in World War II. We see a little bit of his PTSD that he's got going on because it's... It's not good. And it's interesting because he doesn't just say that they killed the guards, but instead he calls it... It wasn't warfare, it was, it was murder. I've had enough of killing. But if he's not there to kill Latus, then why is he there? His answer is such a pivotal scene within the movie and to the, the whole theory. But it's not just Teddy. Chuck also gets in on it here in a minute. And so Teddy's whole reason for taking this job in the first place is because he started looking into Latus. That led to Latus's disappearance. And then he started to look into Ashcliff, 
But he noticed every time he started to ask questions, he could never get any answers out of anybody. A lot of people know about this place, but no one wants to talk. Eventually, this leads him to finding out that they're actually funded by a special grant from the House of Un-American Committee. UAC. Which is a real thing that was founded in 1938, so this is not just some sort of made-up thing just within Teddy's head. Now, of course, Chuck also knew exactly what it was as soon as he said it. How exactly fighting the commies from an island in Boston Harbor? How indeed, and Teddy actually thinks that they're experimenting on people by conducting experiments on the mind. And learning everything that they can about the mind and how it works to either create their own soldiers or to drive the enemy insane. At least that's my guess. It's like some MK Ultra kind of stuff. Chuck thinks this entire thing is crazy because why would you not? It sounds insane. But Teddy actually found somebody that used to be at Ashcliffe and talked to him. The guy's name is George Noyce. And George's story is really interesting and it's something that I never would have guessed because he got a chance to go and do Socialist. a psych study he testing out a new product. Toothpaste. So he starts seeing dragons everywhere. Chuck, how do you know that? Like the amount of confidence that Chuck says this with, Teddy doesn't pick up on it because of, uh, because of something. So Teddy continues on talking about Noyce saying that after that happened, he went crazy and he ends up in Ward C. They release him after one year. Then whenever he gets out, he goes and stabs three more people and instead of taking the insanity deal, he says no, no. Begs the judge for the electric chair anywhere but a mental hospital. He ends up with life in prison in Dedham. And it is here that Teddy finds him and is able to ask him questions and it is very clear that there is something much bigger going on. It's pretty clear from what he tells me. They're experimenting on people here. And I mean, this is a lot, and so Chuck's gotta ask, you know, how do you believe a crazy guy? How do you believe a crazy guy? Teddy responds, Crazy people, they're the perfect subjects. They talk, nobody listens. So because of all of this, Teddy doesn't want what was happening at Dachau in World War II to start happening here in his own country. And just like then, he will do anything he has to to stop it. Now, now I find out it may be happening here on our soil. For him, it's not about getting revenge on latest, but it's all about getting enough information to go and expose Ashcliff and everything that they're actually doing to the world. I'm gonna get the proof. I'm gonna go back and I'm gonna blow the lid off this place. This is exactly why they had to make him crazy. Because... Crazy people, they're the perfect subjects. They talk, nobody listens. And this is where Chuck points out something really interesting. He started asking around about Ashcliffe, and then suddenly they need a U.S. Marshal. Because there's no way a place that would have all of this stuff going on would just have this as a coincidence. There's got to be a bigger picture. You were looking into them, they were looking into you. They have us both here now. And this is when McPherson shows up with his entire crew looking for the marshals because, of course, they're on an island. They're going to find them. There's nowhere for them to hide. So they go get in his ride so he can give them a ride and also be protected from the storm. And they can make it over to Collie's. And whenever they get out, he says, Get right off. Dr. Collie wants to talk to you now. And that it's turning into a hurricane out here. This thing is turning into a hurricane. So they do that. They go in, they get showers, and they get some new clothes because, of course, theirs is soaking wet. And the new clothes that they get are actually the orderly whites. That's something really nice in a prison gray, if that don't work for you. But here, Trey also says two things that really catch my attention. That is, if we all don't wash away first. So he brings up the storm, and... I'm afraid your uh, smoke's pretty much done for. And it's so. something about this look, this knowing look about the pack of smokes, because there's something extra going on. Then right after this, they head to Dr. Colley's office where they actually interrupt a meeting that is going on. And just what is this meeting about? The storm. It's about the hurricane that is fixing to be here. We're on an island in the middle of the ocean during a hurricane. They're trying to figure out what to do if it floods over in Ward C. They're trying to think of how to keep everybody safe and I guess who's worth saving and who's not. But the important thing that I want you to get from this moment, this scene, is that Teddy's not in the room when they're talking about the hurricane. If the facility floods, they'll drown. 
You know that. Because this is a real thing that they have to take seriously or else people are going to get hurt. And that's not just the guards, it's not just the orderlies, but it's the 42 patients that are in Ward A and B and also the 24 patients that are over in Ward C. 24 human beings. I put all 42 in Wards A and B in manual restraints as well. And it's right after this is mentioned that Teddy actually speaks up because something has caught his attention. I I'm sorry, Doctor. I, I, I just have one quick question. And it has to do with a note that was found in the room earlier. The law of four, I love that. Am I crazy, or does that sound like it's an inside joke that is just the funniest thing to him and probably everybody else in the room? That is correct, yes. But not to Teddy, because he can do simple math. A total of, what, 66 patients at this facility. And he knows that 24 plus 42 equals 66, and the question that was on the note is... Who is 67? So, I mean, now they at least know what it's supposed to mean, but they still got to figure out exactly who is the... 67th patient, Doctor. And, of course, the 67th patient is supposed to be him, and from everything that has happened up to this point and everything that's happening right now, it's clear that Kali was the one that actually planted it in the room. I mean, just look at his face. You can clearly tell that he's like, hee hee, it was me, hee hee. But he made the remark that that's definitely in Rachel's handwriting. It's not mine, it's definitely Rachel's. Ah, uh, this is definitely Rachel's handwriting. And luckily for them, they can just go ask her about the note now. Rachel's been found, safe and sound. So now they head over to Rachel's room where the first thing Teddy notices is the fact that her feet are completely fine. Which tells us and him that uh, she was hidden for this entire time. She didn't go outside. She didn't get her feet all cut up. She's not really even that dirty or anything. Who are these men? But Teddy's a much better detective than I am, and so he just, once more, does his job really well. But it's one thing to ask somebody questions that's this insane, and it's another to actually get some answers, but Teddy just starts with the best question of, what did you do today? I made breakfast for Jim and the children. And I sent the children off to school. I decided to take a long swim in the lake. This, this line, this line gets me. I see. Which it also gets Teddy too, but that's the whole point, is that this entire idea of the lake and what she did is supposed to be making its way and burrowing deeper into his brain. And I feel like it has mine too from how much I've looked into this movie at this point. And after that? But to push it even further, Rachel starts to get really weird and slowly walks up to Teddy. I thought of you. And then you realize that she thinks he's... Don't you know how lonely I've been, Jim? Which was her husband, and it makes sense on why this is her reaction to seeing him again. God. <laughs> and Teddy's reaction is just like, can somebody do something? Like, I don't know what, like, I'm awkward in this moment. Somebody help me, and nobody does anything. Because they need this to work, they have to plant the idea in his mind that his wife drowned their children. And you can see it slowly start to take effect as Teddy leans in and hugs her back. Rachel. <laughs> It'll be all right. But this doesn't last for long because, remember, she is crazy. I buried you. Do you remember if she's crazy or not? Do you remember the ending? Because she ends up getting mad at Teddy because she thinks that it's Jim, and of course she had to bury Jim, and that makes her mad. And then she realizes, well, if he's buried, then this can't be him. So who is this? <laughs> and this is finally the moment that people actually jump in to do something and help Teddy. Which I mean by help, they just get him out of the room and take him back to Dr. Collie's office so they can talk about what in the world just happened. But the only answers that we really get is that Rachel was found up next to the lighthouse. We found her down by the lighthouse. Because of course she was. And it's here when Teddy starts to not feel good. I find it interesting because in response, Dr. Colley begins to list off what is happening. Photosensitivity, headache sometimes. But he makes it sound like there's side effects of something else and of course ask him, are you having a migraine? And to help out with that, he goes and gets some pills. I don't, I don't want to stop pills. the pain. But I don't know if you've ever had a migraine, but as soon as somebody says, hey, this will help, sure. 
Yes, please. I've, I've got to have something. i got to figure this out. Yeah, pills are a help, but the best thing for him is to go and lay down for a little while and try to sleep it off. And because the storm is so bad, they have now moved everybody into a big basement sleeping area where all the cots are. The safest place to be when the hurricane hits. But what actually catches Teddy's attention, even while he's got all this stuff going on, is this guy over in the corner. Who is that? And of course, Buffalo Bill here is actually the warden. That's the warden. That, that just made everything so much weirder. <laughs> and pretty quickly, Teddy ends up passing out and we get another weird dream sequence. And this one here is clearly the most detailed and it still does what the last one did in recapping everything that has happened throughout the day. Because to start off, we have this PTSD inspired nightmare that he has as he's walking back through his time at Dachau, seeing just all of these bodies just everywhere. But there's one that not only catches his attention now, but has been catching his attention every time we visit this scene, and it's of a mother and her daughter. And as he passes by, he ends up turning back to see that it's now Rachel, but the little girl has stayed the same. Then she ends up opening her eyes and saying, You should have saved me. You should have saved all of us. After this, Teddy's then walking in Kali's office, and just like he did with Dr. Nyring, whenever he looked around the chair, he now sees Andrew. Ladies. No hard feelings, right? He walks over, gives Teddy a cigarette, then lights it for him, shows him Teddy's flask, and says, A little something for later, because I know you need it. And then suddenly, Latus is just switched out with Chuck, and Chuck's over here saying, Clock's ticking, my friend. We're running out of time. And then a woman screams, and Teddy turns to see that it's Rachel, and she's covered in paint. And her kids are at her feet, and she looks at Teddy and asks him, Give me a hand here. And reluctantly, Teddy picks up the same little girl that he saw back in World War II as she asks, Why did I miss the enemy? And because of what we know happened in Dachau, he responds honestly when he says, I wanted to, but by the time I got there, it was too late. And then we have Teddy and Rachel standing together in the water as they watch the kids. And he's doing the same thing that he did when he was in Rachel's room by taking the role of her husband, Jim. And I know Jim died in World War II, but this is a dream. Everything's figurative, and it's just a way for his brain to process what all has happened during the day. That's the exact reason that they needed this hug and everything to happen in Rachel's room, because Dr. Colley even says that... I didn't want to interrupt. I thought she might tell you something. Yeah, to give him answers. Answers that are like sinking their teeth into his brain. Because to recap his dream, he talked about what happened in Dachau. He talks about his time in World War II. He talks about Andrew Latus. The drinking has also been brought up. And of course, Rachel was a huge part that forced him into the role of Jim earlier. And this is just a more exaggerated example of that here. And we'll talk more about the little girl later because right now, Teddy's waking up. <laughs> Storm is going crazy outside, and somebody's walking in, and who, who is that? So now Dolores is just here, walking around, which is weird. And she says that Latus is still there, and Teddy needs to get him. And then she encourages him for just a second. And then Teddy wakes up, and it's the next morning. And here's the thing. This movie is extremely detailed. That's the reason this video is so long. But because of the detail, I'm hesitant to say that he's still dreaming. Because we see multiple dream sequences that he has throughout the movie, and not a single time does it happen where he's having the dream in the actual location that he's currently at. And as we'll see here in a little bit, this is not the last time Dolores walks in as he is awake. And if you're watching closely, you realize that this is all he says. Why are you all wet, baby? I know. Which would definitely be weird to hear somebody whisper next to you while you're trying to sleep, and probably something you would tell whoever is running this entire experiment. Because of course, it comes up later, and he's shocked that it happened. What did you say? You know exactly what I said. Because he said it out loud in front of an entire room full of people. At this point, some of y'all are probably thinking, I need to be thrown in Ward C, and luckily, we get to go to Ward C. Nice day for a stroll, don't you think? Ward C, for example. Because the storm and the storm damage is so bad across everything. What was that? 
okay, maybe I am going crazy, is so bad it caused a ton of damage, and it also knocked down the power that was headed over there towards C, which... I think the whole electrical system is fried. As we know from earlier, whenever they were having the meeting, would also cause the cells to be opened. The cell doors will open. But now they're trying to fix everything. They're trying to get everybody back where they're supposed to go. And as Teddy and Chuck walk over into Ward C, we can actually see the lights and everything flickering as they're walking in. And I mean, hey, they should have called me and I could have, you know, came out and actually fixed up their power for them. For those that don't know, I am also a master electrician. So as Teddy and Chuck are walking, Teddy brings up George Noyce again, talking about Ward C. And then he also says this. He's here, latest. I can feel him. Which I get because now he's been told multiple times by Dolores that Latus is here. And since we know Dolores is not actually there, this is just his mind hoping and thinking that he's going to get to finally confront Latus. And I mean, he's been working for years, waiting for this moment, and finally he's here at the last place that he knows for a fact that Andrew Latus was, so much so that he can still feel it and thinks that he's there. I mean, it's just like whenever you go bowling and you're all lined up and you're like, this is it, I'm, I'm gonna get a strike. I can feel it right now. This is the moment that I'm finally not gonna have a score of under 100. I'm gonna prove to everybody and myself that I'm actually good at this game. Ah! Tag, you're in! And speaking of games, I guess we're playing tag now. So Teddy's chasing, Chuck can't keep up, and the only thing I figure is that Teddy's thinking that since this is clearly one of the patients, he could ask Billings here uh, about Latus. At least I think that's his plan anyway. But Billing quickly interrupts that plan. And I know he's insane, but the stuff that he says really makes me wonder what all has he heard about the outside world? We hear things here about the outside world. Because he doesn't want to leave to go back to the outside world. You know how a hydrogen bomb works? <laughs> With hydrogen! Because clearly he's heard enough that he can explain how an H-bomb works. It implodes, creating an explosion. And this is not the first time that we've heard a patient talk about bombs in the outside world. Bombs that can reduce whole cities to ash. Why are these patients in an insane asylum being told about one of the scariest inventions to ever come out? Because both of them had been told so much about it that they would rather stay there than to ever leave. <laughs> Anyway, Teddy gets the upper hand. He then begins to choke Billings and, I mean, like, choke him, choke him until Chuck runs up and says, Hold on! Like, you, you gotta stop! And then a guard shows up and gets Chuck and says, We've gotta leave. You, you are not allowed to come. You stay here because I don't know what's going on. But you're not allowed. No, no, not you. Not you. Take a walk. And so Chuck, the guard, and Billings head off to the infirmary to go get him checked out, leaving Teddy to just roam Ward C on his own. And of course, as you remember, they're dressed like the orderlies, and Chuck is literally a doctor that is there. So the guard just sees this as one of the orderlies and a doctor dealing with a patient. And of course, Dr. Sheehan realizes this and knows that he can't blow his cover as Chuck and just leaves as the guard said, so that way no more words can be exchanged. Which then leads us to have Teddy walking around around in the bottom of Ward C where it is dark enough that he has to keep striking matches to be able to see what in the world is going on. Ah! Which leads Teddy all the way up to the cell of somebody he knows. Let me see your face now! What? That's right, Mr. Rorschach here is actually George Noyce, and it's not looking good for him because... They say him this now. They say him never leave here. And of course, Teddy's wondering, George, what are you doing here? You're not supposed to be here. You got out. How in the world did you get back? I'm gonna find a way to fix this, you understand me? I'll never get out now. Got out once. Not twice. Never twice. And then he makes it clear that this is all Teddy's fault, and it's because he's been asking all of these questions. I'm back in here because of you. But not only that, he also makes it clear that all of this is a big setup and just a show specifically for Teddy. They knew all of this is for you. Including his partner, Chuck. I know people like, I trust this man. Then they've already won. Then George begins to cry because he realizes what that means for him and that he's gonna go to the lighthouse. They're gonna cut into my brain and I'm only here 
Because of you! But maybe there's some hope, and George sees this for just a brief second and knows that if Teddy can just get all the information that he needs and get out of there, so that way he can expose everything that's going on, he would be saved instead of trying to go and kill Latus. You can't dig out the truth and kill Latus at the same time. You, you gotta make a choice. And he tells him that he has to make a choice. But of course, Teddy doesn't want to kill Latus. But it's clear that a part of him does, and that part of him is starting to walk out of the corner again. Let it go. Tell him, Teddy. Because she already told him earlier, He's got to kill Latus. And George and Teddy know each other pretty well, and George realizes that this is a whole revenge thing, and all he has to do is just let her go. Because if he can actually let her go, Teddy can leave, and George might be saved. I can't. You have to let her go! I can't! I can't! With that, that means it's not just the end for George, but most likely for Teddy, too. Then you'll never leave this island. And so George tells him that he was transferred out of Ward C, and of course, he's not up there in either Ward A or B. And that just leaves one place. And with that, we get one last word from Jackie Earl Haley. God help you. I'm reading my notes, and I just... This theory is so good! And I say that because this didn't hit me till right now, so just listen. Teddy and Chuck end up catching up together as they're walking through the woods, and Teddy, of course, is headed to the lighthouse. And it's clear that Teddy is now very skeptical of Chuck, and Chuck is like, hey, I found this paperwork on Latus. Which, honestly, wouldn't help them all that much, because even Teddy had already found that before he got there. And so Teddy thinks something's up and he tells him, I'll just look at it later. Yeah, take a look. I'll look at it later. And so both of them set off, they make their way over to the bluffs where they can see the lighthouse, but it's really clear that it's gonna be super difficult to get to and Chuck says, it's too dangerous for us to go there. We should just head back. What can I say to you to stop you? Why, why would you want to, Chuck? Why? And at this point, Teddy's thinking, of course you would say that, Chuck. And he gets mad at him, ends up setting off alone to head over to the lighthouse. He ends up getting over to the lighthouse, and it's clear that he would have to jump in the water and swim to it because the tide's up. So then he walks back up there to where Chuck was and tries to tell him this but all that is left of Chuck is like a half-smoked cigarette. And because of where it's sitting, Teddy then walks over and looks down to see Chuck is down there on a rock. But we see whenever Teddy makes his way all the way down there to see if Chuck's alive or if, you know, the, the rock took him out, it's just a vague outline of a person shape. Person shape? What does that mean? So this means that Chuck is now gone. And since his body's not down here, we can assume that this is just another one of Teddy's hallucinations that he's having. But here's what we know is that Chuck is actually Dr. Sheehan, who is a doctor there at Ashcliff, and he is not an actual marshal, but he has just been pretending this entire time to be Teddy's partner. And that this moment here is how Dr. Colley and everybody around him decided to get rid of Chuck. Now this moment's not as big as the storm, but it's up there. And what's actually just up there a little bit farther away from Teddy right now is a cave. And there's a fire inside. And so Teddy climbs up there and finds a woman in there. And she immediately knows that he's... You're the marshal. But even with that, she decides to keep her knife. I'm gonna keep this. And since she's not dreaming of John Coffey, that must mean one thing. Rachel Solando, the real one. Yes, the real Rachel Solando, who was never married, never had kids, and was actually a doctor there at Ashcliff. You think I'm crazy? Which it is hard to believe her since they've done so much work to make Rachel Solando out to be crazy. No. No, no, I never. And if I say I'm not crazy. And of course, she can't just say that she isn't crazy, because that's what a crazy person would say. It's a Kafkaesque genius of it. And once you've been declared insane, they're then able to point at anything that you do and say, yep, that's why they did that, because they're insane. And anything you do is called part of that insanity. So of course, Teddy asks, 
what happened? So she begins to tell him that she ended up asking too many questions, starting off with the large shipment of psychotropic drugs. Yeah, I had to look down at that word. Don't judge me. I asked about the surgeries too. And she doesn't just mention the lobotomies, but she actually goes into detail about how they do it. And go through the eye with an ice pick. Pull out some nerve fibers. Makes the patients much more obedient. And she also talks about electric shock therapy as well as how the brain is the center of where pain actually comes from. The brain controls pain. The brain controls fear, empathy, sleep, hunger, anger, everything. So her theory is that they are attempting to erase people's emotions, to erase any feelings of love that they've ever had, to erase the feelings of pain that they've experienced in the past or that they can experience, and then also erase all of their memories, making them the perfect soldier. They're told what to do, and then they go and do it without asking any questions or having any feelings about it. And of course, Teddy says, but all of that would take years of research, hundreds of patients to experiment on. And then she also says that 50 years from now, everybody will be able to look back and know that this is where it all started. Here, this place is where it all began. We tested patients on Shutter Island. But Teddy says since he's been gathering the truth, they can't stop him from leaving. He's a marshal. I was an esteemed psychiatrist. Didn't matter. Which I mean, she's got a point. But I think the even better point that she makes here is that they're going to use his past trauma to convince people that he just snapped. Point to some event in your past and say it's the reason you lost your sanity. And that they'll all end up saying, Of course he cracked. Who wouldn't after what he'd been through? They can say that about anyone. They're gonna say it about you. And then she asks about his head. Are you having funny dreams? Funny dreams lately? Trouble sleeping? Yes. All of the above. Absolutely. And then ask if he's taken anything. The aspirin. Jesus. And then goes in on the food that he's been eating, the coffee that he's been drinking, and... You tell me at least that you've been smoking your own cigarettes. From that, she then lists off all of the side effects that are fixing to come along with what they have been drugging him with this whole time. Policy comes first. Seen any? Walking nightmares lately, Marshall. And some of y'all over here are just thinking, oh, no, nah, he's he's definitely crazy. He definitely did all of that stuff. It, what is this, huh? What is this supposed to be, an elaborate way to get him to stop smoking? Huh? Because I don't think lying to a crazy person and making them paranoid about cigarettes is going to be the best thing for you to do to actually get them to stop. And I would say just leave it to the professionals, but the fact that everyone knows what is going on in the lighthouse makes me think otherwise. Tell me what goes on in that lighthouse. Brain surgery. They learned it from the Nazis, kind of. After this, Teddy ends up falling asleep in the cave. She wakes him up and says, you gotta leave, because I'm fixing to head out. I move all throughout the day, different spot every single night. They think that I fell to my death off of the bluffs, and I'm not gonna let them find me. But of course, Teddy's like, why don't you just go to the dock and like get on the ferry and leave? The only way off the island is a ferry, and they control it. And then before they go their separate ways, she quickly reminds him, Marshall, you have no friends. And now being alone, Teddy makes his way back up the bluffs and over to a road where he actually gets picked up by the warden. We were wondering when you'd show up. And along the ride, the warden talks a whole bunch about violence and being violent. I'm not violent. Yes, you are. You're as violent as they come. I know this because I'm as violent as they come. But the two biggest things that we need to get from this is that he briefly talks about the storm, and then he also says this. Charlie thinks you're harmless, that you can be controlled, but I know different. And it's interesting because it seems like the reality is actually both, that he can be controlled, but he is also still violent. If I was to sink my teeth into your eye right now, would you be able to stop me before I blinded you? Give it a try. That's the spirit. And speaking of Dr. Colley, Teddy actually finds him coming out of like a group meeting with all of the patients and orderlies. And it's interesting because everybody there seems to be upset or uncomfortable that Teddy's even there. For sure, yeah. So of course, Teddy asks, hey, what all's going on? And Colley begins to explain that there was an unidentified man that attacked a patient over in Ward C and then also went and talked to a paranoid schizo 
named George Noyce. And Vin says that George Noyce was actually beat up by a patient two weeks ago because of the stories that George had been telling. Keep all of that in mind for here in just a minute. Because Teddy doesn't know what to think about it either because, of course, it was him. And I guess since he seems a little bit on edge right now, Kali decides to offer him another cigarette. No oh, thanks, I quit. Kali says, I guess this means you'll be taking the ferry, and Teddy responds, yeah, we got all we came for. We, Marshal? And then they go through this whole thing about him not having a partner. You don't have a partner, Marshal. You came here alone. That he's actually been here alone all this time? And while Teddy is trying to process what he just heard, Collie's speaking this entire time, and it's interesting because what he's saying sounds a lot like the truth, but then it's also veiled with just a thin layer of psychiatry speak. People, yourself included, don't understand. So as soon as Teddy seems to have actually processed this information, Collie looks at him and says, So what were you saying about your partner? What partner? I mean, come on. They're literally trying to drive him crazy and make him doubt everything that's going on around him. And that's what's so funny to me because that's like the plot, no matter what side you're on, at the ending, both sides end up saying the same thing with just two different meanings. That they drove him to believing that he was crazy and denying what they had set up as his reality. And this is one of those scenes that makes me doubt that he was ever crazy in the first place. Because Teddy goes and grabs his tie and whenever he's trying to sneak out the back of the facility to actually go to the lighthouse, he accidentally runs into Dr. Nyring. Going somewhere? And of course Dr. Nyring realizes this isn't good and goes to pull a syringe to stab him with. Which, I mean, hey, that's not cool. But luckily, Teddy gets the upper hand and actually gets the sedative away from him. What you going to do? Kill me? And then Dr. Nyring begins to talk about trauma and says this. Wounds can create monsters and you, you are wounded. Which, I mean is kind of right on the nose, especially whenever it's coming from one of the head guys at this entire facility and looking Teddy directly in the eyes and telling him you're exactly what we need to make a monster. I agree. Yes. So of course Teddy stabs him with the needle. Then he goes for a run, he blows up a car, he goes for a little swim as well, he knocks out a guard, he takes his gun, he goes up all three of the levels, doesn't find anything except for whenever he makes it to the top level in the lighthouse, he can hear somebody inside. And he kicks the door open when we have Dr. Colley sitting there at a desk and he says, Why are you all wet, baby? That catches Teddy off guard, but he wants to first check to make sure that nobody else is here in the room. Checks everything out, sees if anybody's hiding anywhere, and Dr. Colley actually tells him, Hey, that gun's not loaded. We made sure of that before you came up. But with that, Teddy does notice that there is a handgun sitting on the desk. And also on the desk is a phone or a call box or something to where Dr. Colley can talk to the people outside of the lighthouse. And he says that Dr. Sheehan has made it. And he tells him, go check on the guard first before you come up. Then right after this, Dr. Colley asks Teddy, how are the tremors? How are the delusions? Not bad. They'll get worse. Teddy, knowing all about it and the side effects that he has from being drugged, says that he talked to Dr. Solando and that she's actually still alive. She told me about the neuroleptics. Did she not? Which Kali just says, oh, well, she isn't real and... Your delusions are more severe than I thought. And then Kali tries to make it clear to Teddy that he's not on any drugs. It's the fact that he's having withdrawals from not being on chloro... Chlorpromazine. Chlorpromazine. I'm not a fan of pharmacology, but I have to say in your case. Chlorpromazine what? Which is the drug that he's been taking for the last two years. Past two years, you, you, you've had somebody slipping me drugs in Boston. Because he's actually been a patient there for the last two years. You've been here for two years, a patient of this institution. You really think you're going to convince me I'm crazy, huh? And to clarify, Collie ends up handing him over the paper that he didn't want to read earlier from Chuck and tells him to go ahead and read it now. And whenever he begins to look at some of the details, it's actually about him. F former U.S. Marshal shows no remorse for his crime because he denies crime ever, ever took place. And here's my thought on this entire thing is that I think that the paper Chuck had earlier when he went to hand it to him 
was actually the intake form for Andrew Latus with all the different information listing off what he had done back then that Teddy would have believed at the moment. And that the paper in the woods would have been sort of a test for Teddy to see if he was going to keep going to the lighthouse or if he was going to take it and actually try to leave the island, which I'm sure the entire plan would have shifted and something would have come up if that were the case. Because as we know, this is a different piece of paper because Teddy actually picked up the one that Chuck had earlier. And I'll be honest, I don't remember what he did with it. I don't know if it just got soaking wet whenever he went for a swim or if he left it in his pants pocket and changed. I'd, I don't know. But he doesn't seem to have it now. And this paper that's sitting here that Collie has is clearly a different one because they could always just make another one. It's not a big deal. But Teddy doesn't care about any of that. He just wants to know, where is Chuck? I've had enough. Where's Chuck? Where is he? And at this, Collie gets up, walks over to the board, and begins to explain... It's your rule of four. And begins to call Teddy Andrew. Violation of... Focus, Andrew! What do you see? Because we have Edward Daniels and Andrew Latis. And it's the same thing with Rachel Solando and Dolores Chanel. It was Chanel, am I correct? So Collie's explanation is that Teddy... Yes, his name is Edward, but he goes by Teddy for the entirety of the movie, has come up with this entire anagram and backstory and that his name is actually... Andrew Latis. 67th patient at Ashcliffe. He's you. And then he also did the exact same thing for his wife. But he couldn't use Dolores Latus, so then instead he used her maiden name to come up with Rachel Solando. Which we'll come back to Rachel here in just a second, but this is something that they claim was just a break in his reality to cause him to come up with this whole new personality and backstory. You've created a story in which you're not a murderer, you're a hero. Which to me sounds like a subconscious decision to come up with an anagram. And the only anagram that I can think of is Voldemort from Harry Potter and how it includes like his full name, which is like Tom Mor Morvolo Riddle, and then it means I am Lord Voldemort. <laughs> which didn't just happen, it was an active decision to choose that. Because I'll be honest, if I went through something like this and my complete mental state broke I'm not gonna go with whatever an anagram for my name would be probably just go with like robert johns or something like that because you're expecting me to believe that this guy that is mentally insane has a subconscious that is able to create such a detailed reality that it is hard for me to wrap my head around how how big and detailed it is, right? Like, it's not like the Rachel Solando that we saw earlier that was calling him Jim. She just believed that everything was still fine and that there was nothing wrong and that she wasn't actually in an asylum and she was just in a neighborhood. Seriously, Doctor, how is it possible that the truth never gets through to her? Which I could see that, you know, just sort of ignoring what's going on around you. But this? There's no way! And you've uncovered a conspiracy so that anything you can dismiss as lies, Andrew. But Collie says that that is the truth, that you are Andrew Latest, that you have been here for the last two years because you cannot accept what you did or what your wife did. Oh, your crime is terrible, one you can't forgive yourself for. To which Teddy responds and says, No, I am Edward Daniels, I am a U.S. Marshal, and I came here to do a job and begins to list off what he's been doing but Collie interrupts him and says been here in this fantasy for two years now I know every detail patient 67 the storm Rachel Salando your missing partner the dreams you have every night hold on dr. Collie we, we there was a lot that you said there and you just sort of skipped over one of those and you don't think I'm gonna notice what well, okay hold on so he says patient 67 which I get, it doesn't really matter what side you're on about patient 67 because both sides realize that patient 67 is going to be Andrew Latis, which is supposed to be Edward Daniels. The 67th patient at Ashcliffe, he's you. And then we also have Rachel Solando, which in a weird way, they're trying to play it off as she never existed and that it's actually just another personality that he also created for his wife. So not only did he create his 
own complete other personality, but he also did it with a full backstory for his wife. But we run into a problem with the Rachel in the cave, because we know she's supposed to be the real Rachel Solando that was a doctor who was there. And before I was a patient at Ashcliff, I worked here. I was a doctor, Marshall. And if you are going to go the Dr. Colley route and say, well, she didn't exist, that was all just in his head, then that means that you have to ignore all of the facts and new information that she gives to Teddy. And of course, it doesn't make any sense for your own hallucination to give you new information and stuff that you didn't know because it's also a part of you, so you can't give yourself new facts and learn new things? That's not how this works. Because she explains one of the drugs and all the side effects that it has. And opium-based hallucinogens. Psychotropic drugs. She also explains a bunch of the surgeries and stuff that are going on and how a lobotomy is actually done. And go through the eye with an ice pick. And she goes into a ton of detail about how pain is processed through the brain. The brain controls pain. And if you want to give Teddy the credit to say that he's that smart and he already knew all of this information, then we also have to look at the fact that not only did he make a new personality for himself as Teddy Daniels, but he also made one for his wife as Rachel Solando, and then he also made a second one of Rachel Solando, the real one, the doctor that was on the island. You act like insanity is catching. That just sounds more insane whenever I say all of that out loud. Then Collie also mentions your missing partner, which was basically something that was forced on him by Chuck disappearing and even Dr. Collie agging it on whenever he had said, So tell me again about your partner. What partner? But then he also mentions the dreams that you have every night. Funny dreams lately. But if we go off of what Dr. Solando said earlier in the cave, dreams are a side effect of the drug that they would have been putting in literally all of his stuff. And so if they have been drugging him for this entire time, Dr. Colley would have known that he has been having these dreams for the entirety of the movie, and they probably would have been able to either listen in or hear what all is going on, because she also asked him if he was having trouble sleeping, and we haven't seen that from him. It just seems like he goes to sleep, has a weird dream, and then wakes up. Except for the night that he sees Dolores whenever he does wake up in the middle of the night. <laughs> so it would make sense that he probably is having a fitful sleep and mumbling stuff in his dream to where everybody around him and anybody listening in would be able to pick up on the little words that he's saying throughout the course of his dreams. I wanted to, but by the time I got there, it was too late. But the biggest thing here is the fact that Dr. Colley says the storm. The storm? Because what you're telling me right now is that Dr. Colley is saying that the entire storm has all been inside of his head and that it never actually happened. Watch out! I've talked about it enough. I mentioned literally every single time somebody else brought up the storm and I believe that Teddy only mentions it one time because somebody else had already said it right before him and he was just repeating what they had said. I thought your investigation was finished. Well, it's not like we could take the ferry. Like there's literally way too much for me to recap every single time that people brought up the storm and things happened because of the storm. There's just no way. The storm is real, and the storm happened all throughout the movie. Even whenever Teddy wasn't around, people were talking about and dealing with the storm. We're on an island in the middle of the ocean during a hurricane. So why in the world would Collie mention it here unless he is just trying to break his reality in this moment? I wish I could let you just live in your fantasy world, but you're violent, trained. Dangerous. You're the most dangerous patient we have. Just as he begins to do whenever he starts to tell Teddy about what happened with George Noyce two weeks ago and how it was actually him who went through and beat him up. Give me one reason why I would even touch him. Because he called you ladies. And then Collie reads their conversation that they had from yesterday. This is about you and ladies. He's saying this is about me and ladies. When you asked him what happened to his face, he said, you did this. He meant that it, 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 it was my you fault. You almost killed him. But before Teddy can question anything, Collie's like, you gotta make a decision right now. Either you're crazy or you're not. You've gotta figure it out because if you don't say that you're crazy, they'll lobotomize you, Andrew. And so Teddy understands and he realizes real quick that if 
he doesn't play by their rules, then they're just going to end him. Dr. Nering's going to turn me into one of his ghosts. But he still falls back on his partner, Chuck. But what about my partner? And basically says that, yeah, you can declare me insane and do all of that. Like what Dr. Solando talked about earlier. But what are you going to tell the Marshal's office about Chuck? You can't have both of us go crazy when we're here. You're going to tell the U.S. Marshal's office that he's a defense mechanism? And of course we get the reveal that Chuck is actually Dr. Sheehan and... He says that he has been Teddy's primary psychiatrist for the last two years. And once again, before Teddy can ask any questions or say anything, Collie's like, look man, you gotta make a decision right now. Either you're crazy or we're gonna lobotomize you. I risked everything to come in here after you. I know, boss. We're running out of time here, Andrew. And then they just admit it to Teddy that every single thing that they have done and every single second that we have seen of this movie has been to get Teddy to believe that he is actually Andrew Latus. That I could construct the most radical, cutting-edge role play ever attempted in psychiatry. Because they thought if they could just let him play out his fantasies that he's been having, then maybe it would come to the logical conclusion that none of the things that he thinks that are going on on the island are actually happening. So Kali looks at him and says, so after two days, of which you regarded the entire time and had very restricted access to literally everything on the island to the point that we were able to stay ahead of you for the entirety that you were here on the island, so why don't you just show us where all of our crazy experiments and all of the surgeries and all the drugs are? Why don't you just show us, huh? And Teddy doesn't have any answers, so he just sits down and listens to him until he grabs the gun and then just points it right at Dr. Collie and... But Collie's okay. Andrew, please don't. And it actually turns out that the gun is fake and that even the blood that showed up behind Dr. Collie was all fake as well as the gunshots themselves. We're telling you the truth. And then Dr. Sheehan jumps in and begins to talk about Dolores and what she actually did. And of course, this makes Teddy mad. Teddy mad? Is that right? This makes Teddy mad. That's right. And of course, this makes Teddy mad. Why does that sound so weird? And of course, this makes Teddy mad to the point that he attacks Dr. Sheehan, accuses him of lying, and then says, you drugged the cigarettes. You drugged the cigarettes! And this is when Kali jumps in again and begins to hold up pictures of each one of Teddy's kids. I guess in this case, I should say Andrew. And just before showing the last one, Dr. Kali explains that the next one is his daughter and that she's the girl that you dream of every single night. The one that tells you you should have saved them. Shows his daughter, whose name is Rachel. Her name is Rachel. Are you going to deny that she ever lived? And if you're asking me, I'm going to deny that this Rachel ever existed and that this is still the little girl that he saw at Dachau. Because I've already talked about the fitful sleep that he was having up all the way to this point. And of course, there's the dreams that they know that he's having because of the drugs that they're giving him. And I mean, listen, which one's more of a stretch that he mumbles a little bit whenever he's having a nightmare because of all of this stuff that is going on or everything else that I've listed off before this. I mean, given the choice between the two, I think I'm going to pick the fact that he probably said, oh, I should have saved you in his restless sleep, of which they would have been watching because they've been watching him this entire time. And I hear you. You're saying, well, how did they get a physical picture of this little girl from Dachau? The same way that the real gun that he thought he had in his hand broke apart into two pieces whenever he grabbed it and realized that it's a toy. So his brain on all of these drugs and everything that's in his system that's causing him to think that the gun is real is making him see what he already believed would be there. The little girl that he has seen all the way from World War II, Doc Al, that has been most recently in his dreams. Why did I see me? And of course, it's also really weird to me the fact that her name is Rachel. We also had Rachel Solando, the crazy one. And then we also had the other Rachel Solando who was actually a doctor. There's, there's so many Rachels, which goes along with the whole thing of slowly planting an idea. Because when Kali says, will you deny that your daughter, Rachel, ever existed? Andrew, are you? Teddy gives in. And you know the next part and how everything plays out. And it's through him giving in that Teddy dies and Andrew fully takes over as his mind recreates everything that he thought happened. Please, God! Oh, no! 
which is not a stretch from all the stories that he's been told, all the dreams that he's been having, and even the delusions that he's having during the day for his mind to be able to recreate all of these things that he has already been told and it is nothing new that his mind is having to come up with and after this he wakes up to dr sheehan and the nurse who was the lady that played the crazy rachel salando rachel and of course he's muttering rachel and rachel over and over again they're like rachel who rachel latest my daughter and they're like Whew. That was a close one. It's like, dang, I mean, y'all are still messing with him after all of this? Why are you here? Because I killed my wife. Because she murdered our children. But Kali goes through and tells him that, you know, we've got to be sure that this whole thing worked because we had a breakthrough nine months ago and we don't want you to go back on it like you did then and have to start all over like we already have once. Nine months ago and then you regressed. I don't remember that. And so after Andrew assures Dr. Colley that My name's Andrew Latus, and I murdered my wife in the spring of 52. We see him shortly after hanging out on the steps, watching everybody as they're out in the yard. And this is when we have the famous ending of Dr. Sheehan coming up, giving Andrew a cigarette, and we can see Dr. Colley off in the distance. As Teddy says, I Gotta get off this rock, Chuck. Get back to the mainland. Whatever the hell's going on here, it's bad. Leading Dr. Sheehan to realize that it didn't work, and he signals to Kali, who just looks devastated, leading us up all the way to this point that makes me wonder, with everything that I've laid out, which one do you think he is? A monster or a good man? Andrew Latus or Teddy Daniels? Because I have my answer, so now it's to you. Which one would be worse? To live is a monster, or to die is a good man. Teddy? Ah, did it. I, you don't understand. This is the third day that I had to record this video and currently I am about to hit four hours of recording. I don't know how long this is, but if you made it to here, I, I thank you so much. That's awesome that you made it to the end of probably the longest video that I've ever made. And if you did make it here, I hope you had a wonderful time. Even if I didn't convince you, that's completely fine. I mean, it's it's really up to you. I think there's good points for both sides. Just there might be some better points on my side. But that's the thing, it's just a theory. A film theory. And if you like this one, good news, because I've got a lot more that I'm working on, and I would actually love to hear your favorite horror movie theories that you have, because I know that there's a lot of them. And I think right now I've got another 11 of them actually planned out that I'm gonna do, just because this is, this is so much fun to me, even though it is a lot of work. So once more, I gotta thank you for making all of this work worth it. And thank you all for all of the support that has already happened just in 2024 the channel has done amazing but for now i just hope that you have an extra blessed day thank you so much again for making it all the way to this part of the video that's that's a that's awesome and i'll see you in the next one